So before, I, before we get into it, let's just cover what we did in a general sense. Um, and that would be to turn the work, scan the site, process the data. We extracted it using the Coco dot. And then uh, the objective of this, the ultimate objective of this project was any between softwares. So we put it into Google Mapper as well. So the site was half mile long on Ferris State University. This is place for its proximity to us and the familiarity we had with it. Um, it was also good for its strengths of range of features, uh, different kinds of curbs, manholes, sidewalks, trees, and the like. So to start out, we needed to determine control. For this, we used a program called C3D. Uh, TopoDot is uh, this online service. And uh, within this service, there's a tool that lets you put in your route and then it gives you a best fit layout of your control. Uh, and we followed this control uh, you know, recommendation from C3D pretty closely. This is a good representation of where our control was for this project. The targets for our control were made of reflective road tape. Uh, we used the board on the right screen to Template so we could get the exact dimensions on each of our control points, which was uh, I can't read it. <laughs> exact dimensions, um, and so action software could easily identify uh, the center of each control point. And uh, within uh, the board is a hole in the exact center. We would drill and pound a mag and then shoot it with GPS to get the control points as well. We uh, leveled through the target. There's a vertical control point on Ferris's campus in uh, Quad, Spencer. So we did two loops, one in the northern half of the loop and another in the southern half. We then did a least squares adjustment on both and uh, applied the corrections. The equipment for our drive, uh, we'll just run through this quick. We have a Regal high speed, high speed single beam scanner a Ladybug 360 camera capable of taking a different at one time. IMU and DMI assist the built-in GPS in uh, positioning, and then we also had a base station running during our uh, drive. So the drive specifically, uh, Tim and Tony from Fishbeck came in the end. So to drive, we need to first calibrate the IMU and DMI uh, to sync it up with the G GPS. The idea of this calibration is to replicate the conditions of the drive. So after the first run with the scanner on one side of the truck angled at 30 degrees, we shut down, reboot with the scanner on the other side of the truck, uh, each side of every uh, feature as the illustration on the right shows. I'm here to talk more about the drive and uh, where is is Christian Johnson. All right, thanks Mitch. So this image up here was photos taken of the laptop while we were driving real time. This image here on the left is part of the calibration process like Mitch touched on. It takes approximately five minutes. You just drive around similar to Drive, you, you can either drive the route that you want to on terrain that's somewhat similar to it. And like he said, it's linking up the IM with the DMI and the GPS and getting everything all flowing together. Once all these once all these boxes are checked green, then you're good to go. The image on the right is actually showing real-time data being taken. There's a bunch of little hexagons there. That's the actual instantaneous locations where the ladybug camera is taking the pictures. About every, uh, you can set that to either a specified time or distance travel to take your pictures. And for this project, we use 30 feet because that's what Fishback uses in their normal projects. And then it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually 
blue lines on the outside, which shows the limits for the scanner's region. So it, uh, the end of November, to Fishback Grand Rapids office to discuss the processing and Tony told us how to actually process all this data and get everything. So he explained the process that the process begins in a Tremble software called Pop and then we bring it into the Regal That's because we have a Regal scanner. And I'll elaborate a little bit more in a second. So OSPAD Tremble software, like I the initial trajectory from the GPS and IMU and the base station we used, we used the Ferris State base station on top of the building. And um, processes the GPS against what that base station is reading, and then it smooths out and uh, creates the best fits case trajectory for the Then once that best fit path is determined, that is then brought into RI process. Um, and in RI process, the traje trajectory can be imported and lined control point and create kind of a more best fit. But in the Regal software, import that, put it in right precision, which then takes the actual scan of the trajectory that the, that the IMU has calibrated out. And so it actually takes the point cloud puts coordinates on all of the based on the target location. Um, and then it's done, then you have to calibrate your images. Like Mitch said that Ladybug 13 camera takes eight images simultaneously. So the on the right is shows our path driven from the IMU GPS because it actually shows the first calibrating everything. The image on the left shows the process of calibrating the skin. So that way when you're doing your extraction from Topo Dot, you can have the images of things like fire hydrants or whatever you're looking for. So how that's done is you can see there's a bunch of different images up there. You would you'd find a spot like a corner in a sidewalk or something or hydrant and find four images that that's in, or four different locations during your drive. You pick a designated spot for in all four of those images. You do that three times, and then the Rye Scan, or Rye Precision software will actually link the photos to the point cloud, which is pretty neat. And then once that's done, then you can uh, export your image file extraction and whatever software you like to use. So this is a typical you know, just screenshot of Topo Dot. How we compute, how we uh, completed our Topo survey. So it's Topo Dot MicroStation application. So you know, if you work with MicroStation, you're familiar with it. This looks familiar. Kind of similar to. Uh, Civil 3D or any other tools on the left or up on the top. Here is a top top view of specified area. On the right hand side, top right, you have your horizontal cross section view so you can make sure that your elevations on whatever you pick are correct. And the bottom right is an image that is taken. The image is really useful for trying to that your sidewalk lines are want them to be or just for searching hydrants or trees or any other any other miscellaneous things. Go ahead. So here's just uh, five tools that we use in TopoDot. We use a ton, but these are kind of like the top five, I guess you could say, up at the top. Um, it's the way you run line work in TopoDot, it's basically similar to a 2D polyline. You can, in CAD, you can draw a normal line, but then you can't do anything with that line, which I can allow, I guess, here next. With the drape, 
do the draping line, which is the bottom right, is how you actually put elevations on your line work. So to do that, you would draw a smart line, open this drape tool, and then, um, and hard to see over there, but you could pick, like you just want to put elevations every five feet or 10 feet or however many feet along that line, and then it'll actually place points on the point cloud, and then actually fits the line to, you know, to the data. Um, the most popular tool we used was called the break line extraction tool, which is at the top right there. Um, so how that works is you just draw a line and then you open up the tool and then you're able to pick really anything you want. Um, we did a edge of bit or edge of pavement and then that gutter pan or flow line and then a top of curb, which is pretty easy to, to see as long as you have a nice clean curb layout. Um, the S identification and survey point tool, which are two tools here on the left side. The S identification is used to find like trees or hydrants, light poles, various things like that. You can just in the top in the top view, you click like the, the example here is a four inch diameter deciduous tree, and then you actually can see the top of the tree here, and then you can pick the top and the bottom of the tree where you can actually go to the base of the tree and then you can actually see how wide the tree is. Um, and then the uh, survey point typically used for like uh, catch basins and manhole. And how that works is you just place a point on the data and then in the uh, horizontal cross section you make sure that you have the right elevation on that point. Next slide. So here is just two quick ways on how we got grades for our DTM. There's a grade tool called uh, Elevation Along Path, and what that does is it allows you to have a uniform grid, like the purple lines, down there across the roadway. Or if you just want to get grades on the bottom of a hill or something, you could draw the you could draw a smart line and then drape it on both ends to either like the top, the top of the grass, or the bottom of the point cloud, which hopefully be the bottom of the grass, or you can actually drop it to an average density location, which is it's really whatever you whatever you prefer. We usually drop them to the bottom, so then that way that would be the closest to actually the, the ground. And then uh, our final drawing. So here's the final product from Topodot. The work was exported from Tobodot, imported into uh, AutoCAD Civil 3D. We added contours to create a final topographic design survey of, a, of the roadway. And we did uh, one foot, we did our contour interval set to one foot. So there it is. Next up to talk is uh, Andy Newman to talk about the project. <coughs> was the uh, software comparison. Christian just talked about the topo dot. What we compared it to was a software called Global Mapper. For those that don't know, Global Mapper is developed by Blue Marbles Geo. We chose software for a number of reasons. The first of all um, is because is because it's aerial based, so it's interesting to see if mobile LiDAR data is and compared to be give similar results ground based such as topo dot, then aerial based ones such as Another reason we chose this is because we have very limited experience in one of our, our photogrammetry 2 class. Um, and since the school already fit into our software free, all this right here is everything that is self-taught covered by trial and error. So it's probably not the most efficient way to work. So after importing the uh, the LAS files in the global mapper, you get a default. This is our entire product. And then on the side is a close up right outside of Swan University Center. This is a point cloud with the colors are the RGB values of the points. The next step was to run some films, clean up the data, take out some noise, make it look better. On the left, and the leftmost button auto classifies the noise, and the right button auto classifies the ground. And what these do is they 
it takes uh well i won't bore you with it but he, he, both of these steps take some time to do especially when your computer crashes quite often um after classification yeah well creates this uh, point cloud in the middle and the correspond to what the feature was classified as and in this case the browns are the ground points uh, after after you get the noise cleaned up, you have to define a path profile, which right now we're still working in 5,000 feet looking down. We need to, in order to extract the data, we need to get close, zoom in, what we're dealing with. To do that, there's a create path profile tool, which is the one that's highlighted on the right hand side. You, once you select that tool, at the beginning of your project, or of interest, and then again, this automatically will create your path profile and give you a default view like this. This view is uh, the view that is parallel with the path profile. So right in this example, you can see the, the elevation detail. This is all noise. Although this is a pretty picture, this really doesn't help us much. There's a tool for a, per, a path that is perpendicular to the profile path earlier. And this is this is the profile path, the yellow line. Here, where the uh, two yellow lines cross, is where this is a snapshot in time right now. This is perpendicular to the profile road. So here's a curve, here's a curve, so this is the road. You can see stairs, these are going down to the rec center, trees, and this, this darker layer right on top, those are the actual points. The green is, is below the ground, points actually taken there. So after, uh, in this view is where the actual took place. In our, for our comparison, the center line, uh, we did this because the center paint line, I should say. did this because it's fairly simple and total that we really just needed a basis of comparison. The road is a hard surface and the paint line is pretty well defined. So to do that, so to do that, you're going to, you start your line, auto or not, and then you start the feature on the we did zoom in closer, but it doesn't look as good. So you select the click a point on the line, and then the elevator select in those points. And you can start if you want to go through. You you know back hand center line, gutter pan, back a curb, edge of a bit, sidewalk, anything. You can do them all at the same time. Once you have your feature selected, hit this button, and it goes down a specified case it was like 15 meters and then you do it is pretty strict pretty nice straightforward um Brett will get into how it compares to topo dot later so all this talk is nice but what actually what is our data so this is a nice feature it actually creates a fly through as if you're dri driving it all point clock so all this these Line green on the side. However, we didn't spend. That wasn't part of the project, so we weren't too worried about cleaning it up too too much. So this is going right over by the Swan right here. As you can see, there's a lot of cars. Huge problem for us. Um, but unfortunately, the softwares are can filter all that. Um, a lot of cars, but you can see very. And this kind of view is what you are extracting. Looks like. When so it is very simple to pick the correct feature you're looking for and like I said, we'll get into how it is. Thank you. Um, I'm Brett and I did the uh, comparison part of this uh, project. And I started out by AutoCAD because that's just um, what well, work out the best. It turns out it didn't really me a whole lot. It was to figure out how to draw perpendicular from um, the 
green here is what we extracted from the topo dot. And then down here you can see this red line we got from the global mapper. This uh, is a side view of it. It's, I noticed this large drop in our points. Not quite sure as to why that happened. Um, it's just the way that the program processed it. Um, but in AutoCAD, I wasn't able to stick with one line and through these curves have it perpendicular from this line to the global mapper. It was just uh, not working out. Just use these segments here and um, broaden all the points. And then I use the point to line tool to create these line segments. Um, both of them, they turned out to be extremely close. Um, they did a good job selecting closer points for the one that on the roof. And uh, when I use this tool, it originally, um, it's supposed to automatically follow the lines, but it really broke it up awkwardly. So started up here, went down to here, down here, to this line, cut across here, down, went up. It, it really was a mess. So it was a lot of trying to figure out where the lines were going and how I was able to split them up and get to actually represent the points. Next tool I used was generate points along the line, and this um, with the line I selected, I used the uh, line to every 50 feet along the line create a point, and uh, with that I was able to um, have a good, not average, but a good um, wide range of points. To compare. Ended up with 40. Each one of those points is here on the global mapper line, and I drew a line using the perpendicular tool um, to just go straight to the global mapper line. And um, the full scale of the project had to be at 1 to 2,500. And then to even start seeing a difference, went down to 200. And then to actually be able to draw these lines, I went to a 1 to 1 scale. They did, they did turn out really close. Closest that the lines were were three, tenths, and then the furthest away that they were would be six. Tenths. But I think that had to do with that big drop in elevation. Um, not quite sure why I did that. Um, we ended up uh, with a very um, close comparison between the two. The only big one that gave us any trouble was that drop. And our final cost estimate, um, we did break this down uh, and we kind of added together all the hours that I used the programs. Um, so that's kind of reflected here. The field was eight hours. Um, we kind of put this in here as kind of what Fishback uses, $1,000 per day for the scanner. And then we have three hours to drive it, three hours to process it, 30 hours to extract the topo, topo dot, and then eight hours for the just under 75 for our project. Uh, big thanks to um, Tim and uh, Tony. They uh, really helped us out. We're very appreciative.
Robert Church and Brent Vanilla, and we did a GLO retracement survey for our project. All right, so the purpose of our survey was to determine the most probable location of the west, north quarter quarter, north, west quarter corner, section 9, top 15, range 12 west, and we wanted to assist the Forest Service in monumenting. So the project location, we're out in uh, about 30 minutes west of uh, town here. So it's a little trip, trip out there, but it's located in the Manistee National Forest. And here's kind of a, an aerial, aerial view of the of Section 9, which we did rather than in the um, corners that are highlighted there, or the three corners that we ended up monumenting. So this is the... Uh, Township map of Monroe Township, and as you can see right up there is uh, Section Nine, and it's completely owned. It's completely owned by the Forest Service. The Forest Service actually acquired patent for this in during the Great Depression. This is basically because people could not afford to pay their taxes, and the land in Section Nine is low lying and swampy, so it's easy to see why they weren't able to provide by farming. So our methodology, we uh, started out by researching uh, title and survey records at the National Forest Service office up in Cadillac. And also made it down to the Nuevo County Records and the County Surveyor's Office. <clears throat> and then we went on to the field work where we looked for evidence of GLO and subsequent county surveys. We also measured into um, the controlling corners and the topographic features in the section. And then we uh, implemented data processing where we computed out where to look for each corner position, look for better evidence, and we also adjusted all of our survey GPS data. And then we more service in monumenting the three quarter corners, and we also provided them with uh, three filled out LCRCs and a survey drawing map compliant with Act 132 of 1970. All right, so these are the our survey our uh, our section actually had to be resurveyed. The original survey, the exterior was done by John Hodgkins. That was done okay, but the interior interior uh, township subdivision was by John Allard. survey work, but the resurvey was done in 1856 by Milton and I, and this is kind of just a close-up of the section, just you can kind of see the differences, but in section 9 you can't really see too much of a difference, but in the next slide we'll get to the overview. So this on your left here is the original survey, and on your right is the resurvey, and you can't really tell here, but uh, down in section 19 here. There's a lake, and it's basically completely missing from this one. And there's also a lot of other, there's, the rivers are misplaced in different sections and all that. So the differences between the instruction of 1830, the instructions of 1833 and 1856. In 1833, you got double corners on the North Township line. And they, all, they started their survey at the southwest corner of section 36. And the instruction in 1850, they eliminated the double corners, and they all and they started at the southeast corner of section 13. So here's kind of the here's the instructions in a graphical method. Um, so section or the instructions of 1833, they would start down here at the southwest corner of section 36, run north 40 chains, north 40 chains. And they would run east on a random, note they're falling, and then they would correct back to seven quarter corner. And they continued this method all the way up to the North Township line where they left all the air in there. They continued this method until they get over over to the uh, western tier sections. And then they would go north 40 change, north 40 change, and east on a random, correct back, and also west on a random, correct back. And as 
sometimes you can see there's also up here, it's hard to see, but they're, they have double corners on the North Township line. Then the 1850 instructions, they start midway in the township and run their line all the way to the western side of the township. Note they're falling, then they would correct back, setting corners at every 40 chains, leaving their error in the western half mile. From there, they would run, they would run from here south all the way down to the south south uh, boundary of the township, and then they would correct back, setting corners at every proportion of 40 chains. And then on the, once they got to the north, they would run all the way out to the north boundary, correct back, setting it at 40 chains, leaving all the air in the last half mile. So the GLO surveyors, John Hodge, Hodgson's did the exterior boundaries, which was held by Milton Nye. John Albert did the interior subdivision, which was found out to be in gross error. He ran zigzag lines without really any order or method. And later research we found that most of Allard's 33 interior townships were found out to be fraudulent. Then Milton Nye did the resurvey of the township, ignoring most of Allard's work. Sometimes he would note finding one of his corners and usually he would say he destroyed it. Milton Nye's resurvey in 1856, he uh, did not hold any original corners in section nine and he noted that the original lines were not to be found and he also destroyed the corners that he did find. So this is section nine, this is how Milton would have ran, would have ran the line. The red lines are his random lines, and the green lines are his corrections back. So he would have started from the south here, ran north, corrected back here, and that was line A. And then line B, he would have uh, ran east on a random, corrected back, setting the quarter corner midway and on line. And then line C, he would have he ran north on his random, corrected back setting corners at every 40 chains, and then line D, he ran east on his random, corrected back, setting the quarter corner and laying out line. So here's the uh, Monroe Township Platts over the years, and we looked at this, just it's kind of a good indicator of where we could expect to find evidence of occupation, and this is kind of shows the different patterns over the years, but for example, we would expect to see some, some sort of occupation here, which we, because it was shown on that map, which we later found there was remnants of fence line and uh, tree lines. So the subsequent county surveys, we did a lot of research and we came across this. This is a old uh, county road commission map where pre our surveyors have noted where there's information on each of the corners. So this was kind of our starting point when we looked into so the, the survey that we ended up retracing basically was William J. Keith was the county surveyor, William J. Keith's survey in 1913, where he did the survey of the north half of section nine. So he this is the path that he ran. He started right here at the west quarter post, and he said noted that he found the old witnesses inside an iron stake. He then went north. 40.3 chains to a found old stake, and then east 40.06 chains to found post. Continued east at 40.03 chains and found corner, and then he went south 40 chains, and we believe he set up temporary stake here because he continued on that line for a total of 80, plus, 80 chains plus 28 feet to where he missed the corner by 107 feet. So we believe then he corrected over and corrected back and found the east quarter corner. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Bob, who's gonna talk about the plan. Okay, Thank you, Moyer. Um, so as Moyer had said earlier, uh, this is a top-down view of section nine. Um, 
where the uh, boxes are located are the corners we had to remonument. Um, it was the west quarter corner, the north quarter corner, and the east quarter corner. Um, I go back. The, uh, the previous capstone group two years ago um, did work in the section to the south, and uh, so we had positions uh, for the corners on the south line. And then um, we tied into the northeast and the northwest section corners and used uh, those locations to compute where to look for the quarter corners. Um, standard of work, uh, we used the National Forest Service for positional accuracy of cadastrophes. The uh, control measurements tolerance was 0 0.08 feet. Corner measurement tolerance was 0 0.16 feet. That was at the 95% confidence area ellipse. Um, equipment, we used uh, Trimble R10 GPS, as well as a uh, Trimble radio and R10 base station. Um, total station, we had a Trimble S7 uh, robot station. Um, we use a base station out for us because, uh, of course, availability was um, not very good. Uh, we attempted to use quarters <coughs> initially, but couldn't get lock even in decently open spaces. Um, so we talked to uh, Mark Tenho and hooked us up with a base radio. Um, so we found uh, very open locations to set control points, and uh, we used those to set the base on. So uh, they gave us better GPS reliability and uh, also increased and accuracy. Uh, we later adjusted the survey data to Opus. Uh, for evidence, on the left side here uh, is a, a ball finger that was found at the west quarter corner. Um, in the middle is a Forest Service post that we found at the north quarter corner. And on the right side is a state that we found at the east quarter corner. Now for the West Quarter Corner history, uh, in 1856, Milton and I set his uh, uh, wood posts, and then in 1895, DeLoss Anderson, the county surveyor, um, visited the corner, uh, noted that the corner witness trees were standing, and then in 1913, William Jacques did a uh, survey of the north half of Section 9, and he noted um, finding Stick. Um, the west quarter corner, uh, we found the iron stake laying down in an east-west plow furrow. Uh, we also found uh, fence remnants running east and west as well as north and south. Uh, there was a red pine tree line to the south and east, and we found evidence of an original bearing tree. Um, so we saw the corner at record bearing distance from the bearing tree and it fit occupation and county surveyor measurements as well. Um, we decided that uh, the west quarter corner was an existing corner because there were remains of GLO accessories. We used that to find the position for the new monument. For the north quarter corner history, once again, Milton 9, 56 said his wood post. Um, William Jacques uh, went to this corner and his survey of the north half of the section. And then in 1989, Lawrence Gibson, a uh, junior forester, um, set the post that we ended up finding laying down, but he didn't believe it to be the right location because there were no uh, bearing trees. And then in 1951, Ralph Smith uh, visited the corner and uh, um, noted finding uh, <coughs> some witnesses. For the north quarter corner, um, we found the 1930 vintage Forest Service post that was set by Lawrence Gibson, uh, just west of a north-south trail. Um, and we set the corner at record distance from a pine stump and proportionate distance from the northeast and northwest section corners. The position fit to where the post was found. This is the north quarter corner Forest Service chart. As you can see on the bottom of picture, it says um, he didn't believe that it was a genuine uh, GLO corner, and he said no barrier trees. Uh, 
uh, the North Quarter Quarry we determined to be obliterated because there were no remnants of GLO accessories, but we were able to find evidence from previous surveys. Uh, this is just a picture of some remains that we had found in our survey. Uh, the East Quarter Corner history, Milton Nye says, yeah. Woodpost in 1856, then uh, William Jekies uh, found an old stake in 1930. And then in 1996, John Dornboss ended up reestablishing the corner position and setting a, uh, a, a pipe um, based on GLO topographic cults. When we visited the East Quarter Corner, we found the pipe, and later, uh, after some digging, found this um, wood stack or old stack at all, uh, which is evidence, and we found evidence of original bearing trees. The stake shadow matched GLO topographic calls and was within a few feet of being halfway in online. Um, in these two pictures, the one on the left is a view from the side. Um, you can just see at the top here, there's a little bit of black, and that is stake shadow. And then on the right is a picture from the top down, and uh, in that red circle is the stake shadow. Um, the east quarter corner we determined to be existent as well because we found evidence of the GLO wood post as well as uh, GLO accessories. Now I'm going to hand it off to Brett Fanella to talk about the methods of uh, digging for a stage out. Hello. Uh, so the way that we ended up, you have to dig to actually find a stake shadow is actually very delicate because when you're looking for a piece of, uh, for a post that's roughly 100 years old, you, it's not really going to be there. It's going to be very fragile if you do find it. So the first step that you had to do was clear the top dirt off of an area within, it was roughly a five by five area that we ended up considering our search area. And then after we found, we scraped all the topsoil off, we had to scrape the top sand layer off about a half an inch at a time until we actually ended up finding what ended up being the shadow of the stake. And once the shadow was found, you had to dig out around it and then take vertical to find the point of the shadow so that you could determine it actually was a stake and not just a, any piece of wood that was sticking out of the ground. And in regards to the pipe that we found in the east quarter corner that didn't really seem to fit anything that we had found, it really didn't fit anything. It, uh, where we found the pipe, it was, it was 16 feet uh, difference and it wasn't really online between anything. And due to the, this is, oh, ex, well, created a long excerpt from our industry mentor, uh, Carraway, and a rough paraphrase of it is that since the, uh, pipe was set in 1996, the last time, the latest that the Forest Service acquired title to land in the area was in uh, 1949, and since it, since the acquisition of title predated the survey, and you can, and it's impossible to uh, claim uh, federal land either by adverse possession or acquiescence. It cannot be considered a property controlling corner to lands in section 10. And then for my invitation, we, at each, uh, each corner, we set a two and a half inch uh, diameter by 30 inch flare bottom pipe with a three and a quarter inch bronze cap, which was then stamped according to BLM standards for uh, section corners denoting the township and range of the corner and also denoting the boundaries of the uh, sections that the corner indicates and then it was also stamped with the surveyor's licensing number as well as the date. 
And then for witnesses, we set four new witnesses at each corner using 60 D nails. And then we scribed and painted each of these witness trees and then painted them up with red oil paint, which uh, added two purpose. One was to witness trees so that they would not be harvested for logging and to cover up any of the left from describing the trees as this would prevent the trees from disease and or insects. And then, these, then we also stamped uh, signs on each of these trees denoting the bearing of distance to the corner and to what corner it was a witness to. And then we also uh, provided corner recommendation certificates for all three of our corners. This is an example of the LCRC or the Art East quarter, uh, West corner of Section 9. And then we also provided a survey map in compliance with Act 132 of 1970 and providing a map of the section as well as uh, as well as witness information for each of the corners within that section. And then approximate costs for our project took us about 10 hours of research, 44 hours of uh, in lab and office work, which according to our rough Estimates of cost per hour, brought to a grand total of just over uh, ten thousand four hundred dollars for the project, and then they provided us with an estimate for what they would provide for doing. Which ended up being really close to what our estimate for the work was as well, and we would like to thank. Uh, Carol Waite, our industry mentor with the uh, National Forest Service. Uh, Dan Pat, who was our uh, Mark Tenho, who was our who provided us with equipment and kind of taught us how to use the GPS base station. Uh, Norman Oak was the was the New Diego County surveyor and he kind of showed us around the uh, with the county records office and kind of showed us how everything is uh, organized within a county survey office. And we and also Bob Mitchell who helped us show helped show us how to actually look for and dig for these forms that we were trying to find. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Application in surveying engineering. And uh, to complete this, we took on the challenge of the flat. The scope of this project was to take the boundary.
he uh, signed us with a couple different options of uh, provided. We thought that it would be an interesting project to do a phase extension on an existing subdivision that uh, we've actually worked on in the past. So, so this is a we were given to start. Georgetown Township on 36 and Baldwin. Um, we were given a degree and uh, um, along the road and the existing utilities. Um, so, since this, this project didn't actually involve any field work on our part, um, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of the same difficulties as a lot of other groups did with their field work, but we did come across. It's a problem and uh, things that made our project unique. Um, one of which was dealing with people working on one drawing, which led to a massive folder of outdated drawings to sort through. Um, also, uh, some, some problems where, where you'd be working on something and you couldn't quite figure out how to work a feature on the desk, and then one of us would walk up and fix it in what matters. Drawing lots on curves was difficult to uh, maintain the minimum uh, back requirements while also trying to balance uh, 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 the minimum um, minimum acreage for the lots on the lots on the corners of the curve. Um, working with alignment with a profile view with a scale factor that was different than the horizontal scale factor was difficult as well. Um, So to start the project, we uh, had to research what um, what zone we would be working in. And this pretty much for our for our purpose, we um, dated and determined the lot size requirements and where on each lot was buildable area. Um, so we were working in a low density residential zone, as you can see here. Um, and so this is our pre preliminary plot that we put together. Um, this is something that we would, if we were going to take this project to the, next, to the next step, we would submit to a number of different departments like uh, the, uh, the road commissioner, the drainage commissioner, um, MDOT, the health department, and then obviously the plat board in Georgetown to get feedback on how our plat looks and uh, I use the fillet command. You just select one line, type it in, you want, select the other line, fills it in, cuts it for you. And from there, I started on the right of way design um, for Ottawa County as well. It's a minimum of 66 feet for the right of way, um, as well as 10 foot wide uh, easement. 
outside of the right way for all the utilities. Um, for that, same thing, just followed the center line of the road. I was able to just set tool offset from center line. You could hit 33 feet, 43 for the easements. From there, started filling in the lot. Picture of the uh, minimum requirements for each lot. Uh, the area has to be at least 1,475 square feet, and the minimum width has to be at least 85 feet across. The 85 feet actually is determined at the setback, which is also listed here. So you have the setback off the right away 40, 40 feet, and then that 85 feet is determined along that line. There also has to be setbacks on each side, so uh, at least one of them has to be 10 feet, and for a total of 20 feet. And there's also a rear setback of 40. So, for the lots, I ended up getting 32 of them in there. Like I said, I probably could have put more in if I would have had the radius is not so big because it created lots on the corners that were a decent amount bigger than the required amount. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit, Jake touched on the difficulty, of, I guess it was more difficult to understand at first, the 85 minimum on the corner lots or the uh, distance across. So in this picture, the dotted white line is the 85 feet calculated across, and the red line is actually the setback. The setback follows the curve of the right away, 40 feet back, and the 85 feet is adjacent, or it intersects it at the midpoint of the arc, creating the straight line. Um, this took a little bit of understanding and also a lot of tries to fit all the lots in on the corners, maintaining all the minimum acreages and all that. <coughs> so this is what we have for our final plat. Um, on the final plat, some of the requirements that are shown on this drawing not going to talk all of them because there's a lot of them. Um, some of them, I'll tell you, is the lot lines, every single one of them, front, back, middle, every one of them has to be labeled with varying distance. Um, curve data, I can see it too well, but that's this. And I have a slide that will be coming up uh, to explain the curve data a little bit more. That needs to be supplied. Monumentation has to be at, shown on the drawing. Monumentation occurs at every deflection within the flat. Um, and then a location map, north arrow scale, all that basic stuff. And then all the certificates at the top are shown. I'm not positive if that's like required, but we threw it in there just to add a little bit to our drawing. And then proper legal description of our land we're subdividing and all the lots to be numbered. And I, we also threw in kind of the existing plats that are surrounded by the, um, that are surrounding them. So, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the curve data. So for curve data is just um, each individual curve along the lot lines. So I ended up having 13 separate curves. In one, you have to specify the length of the curve, the radius of the curve, central angle, and bearing cord. Um, all that. Now I'm going to hand it off to Jake to talk a little bit about the vertical. So.
for our preliminary plat, we needed to have a profile view to design like things like our road, our utilities. Um, we based all this off of a natural ground profile of our center line, um, which is the view shown on the screen. And in order to create this, we had to use uh, civil 3D's tools to create an alignment, which we created along the uh, road with the road that we made from the um, existing connections to the east and west side. And creating the alignment mostly involved learning new tools for doing things we already knew how to do, like drawing a straight line or drawing a curve. Uh, this is a zoomed in view of what we finished from this. The first step to designing things in the vertical view was to develop a profile in the center line of our road, which we based all of our utilities and all that stuff off of. The first step was to match it to the existing pavement to the east and west sides which we had out given elevations for that, and that's where we started. The next step was to draw the road and design the vertical curves at the, for our, the low and the high point of our roadway. And essentially, we just smoothed the terrain out. And finally, we used this to place our utilities and calculate things like the low point and slopes for our utilities and roadway. Here's a zoomed out layout of our finished vertical profile, which includes the roadway and all the utilities. Uh, next, I'm going to hand it off to Adam, who's going to talk about the core utilities. <coughs> For utilities, we kept it pretty simple. We're just, we just did sanitary, water, and storm. Uh, didn't get too crazy. Didn't get well with it, stuck pretty much by the book with the standards and um, typicalities of the surrounding areas. Um, all the utilities have to be within the right of way. I think that goes pretty much without saying. And if they're ever outside the right of way, you need to propose an easement for it, um, which we have done as Jake talked earlier about the 10 foot easement off of the right of way on each side of it. Um, Due to the contouring of the land, the uh, everything flows from the east side to the west side, uh, and we try to uh, lay out our utilities uh, doing so, starting with the east and heading to the west, just makes it easier that way. Um, and we also wanted to start on the uh, existing connections on the east and the west side. Uh, for Sanitary, we only had the connection on the west side, um, which is kind of a bummer because it would be easier if it started on the east, but we had to go against the flow. Uh, so, we started, so we started with that connection on the west side as we worked our way eastward. We tried to stay uh, on one side of the road, not shifting over to the other, trying to stay inside of its own lane, as it were, and we succeeded in doing that. Um, and we set manholes every 350 feet ish as due to the typicalities of the surrounding areas as well as the standards. Uh, next. Uh, this is the vertical of the sanitary. Um, we try to keep it in line as best as we could with the proposed grade. Uh, it has to be about 10 foot minimum ish from the proposed grade. Um, which we have succeeded. I sure hope you can see that it's in the red, uh, starting 10 feet, 10 feet, and about 12, 13 feet. So everything's about 10 to 15 feet below the grade, right within the standard. Uh, next, with water, uh, water we had existing connections on both sides. So we had a start point and an end point. And all we had to do was connect those dots. Um, so we started on the east side to work with the flow of where the water was going to go. 
um, and we had to cross the center line once because the east side, east connections on the eastbound side and the west connections on the westbound side. So basically if you strain out the entire road, you're gonna have the west connection on the top and the east connection on the bottom. So it's unfortunately gonna have to cross. Um, we put hydrants, uh, they gotta be eight feet minimum due to Georgetown standards uh, from the right of way inward. Uh, they are typically 350 feet maximum distance apart from each other, so we'll stick with that. Pretty good. Next. Uh, the vertical for it is pretty similar to the sanitary, uh, where we try to follow the proposed grade of the uh, area as much as we could. Um, has to be five foot minimum. We tried to get it to be about six feet at the highest point below the grade, just to be on the safe side of things. Um, in crossing the center line, as I believe Jake will talk about later, with the storm, uh, has, the storm has to be on the same depth, so we had to lower the water to be beneath the storm one time around the center line. And speaking of storm, we'll hand it back over to Jake Nuremberg, who will talk about that. We began designing our storm based on the existing connections we already had. Um, we had connections on both sides of the project, but we decided to start on the west side where there's a yard drain up there. Can't really see it, but where it was falls right where our road is going to be. So we decided to convert it to a storm manhole that catch basins are on it. And after that, since we needed to so after coming up to the starting point, we needed to have a man, uh, catch basin in the manhole at the low point of the project, too, so we placed one there. Next slide. So these are the specifications we used to create this. It had to be directly below the center line of the right of way, which is also the center line of our road. The minimum depth is five feet. We set ours at six, so that way any variations in the road, we would still be at, at five feet. Uh, the maximum distance apart was 300 <coughs> feet, which we, we set ours at 300, and same with the catch basins. Um, so we spaced all our catch basins and manholes at 300 feet apart after picking, start one at the beginning and one at the low point. And this was all done in the horizontal view to figure out our planning for it. So the next step in this process was to place these into the vertical view to make sure that it all makes sense and works. So here's a zoomed in view of our profile, with just the storm showing somewhere in the middle of our project. Um, we used this view essentially to make sure it would flow and made sense with the way our road is because well, water only flows downhill. So we placed all the pipes at a depth of six feet so to make sure that they were within tolerance. We used Excel to uh, calculate the slopes of our pipes at first because uh, we didn't really know enough about AutoCAD to use its tools to come up with those. And as you can see, we set most of our pipes at a depth of six feet, but our first had to be set down to eight feet because other, the road begins to slope up at that point. And we had to keep the water flowing down that way. So we had to make sure that it met the minimum and maximum grade specifications for the size of pipes we chose. And that's the chart on the right. The chart on the left we used with the Manning's formulas I'll show on the next slide. And this was to make sure that it met the standards for um, for hydraulic um, hydraulic capacity. 
So we came up with our pipe sizes based on first the existing connection, which is a 24 inch pipe. So we couldn't have like a 36 inch pipe flowing into it because uh, you can't have more water going in than what it's designed to handle. So we had to keep it below that. And so we decided to start with a 15 inch pipe at the beginning of our run and we tapered it to an 18 after two manholes and then to a 21 inch where we tied into the uh, existing 24 inch. And we used Manning's formula to make sure that we uh, did not exceed the hydraulic capacity and to make sure that the water <coughs> that would enter the system based on a 50 year rainfall would, would be able to be washed out. And thank you to all these people for our, helping us with our project. It would not have been possible without them. Um, thanks to Rod Yuzma from Excel Engineering, who's our industry mentor. Jeff Van Lahr, also from Excel Engineering, helping us with our project. Julia Ryanke from Atwell, was a student here last year, helped us a lot with, that, with our AutoCAD. Professor Mark Powell helping us as our faculty advisor, and also to Professor David Hand for helping us out with our project. Thank you. history of uh, building information models is started with before GIMS. We started with the blueprints and as most of us know blueprints are messy and they need to be redrawn for every update. Uh, around 1982 they came out with um, Architectural CAD or Arch CAD. <laughs> that came out for Apple and Macintosh PCs. Um, and it was regarded as the first commercial BIM able to create 2D and 3D geometry, as well as to use in personal computers. So it was considered revolutionary for the ability to store large amounts of info within a 3D model. Um, and the benefit 
benefits of using um, the point cloud to BIM are quite a few. So it saves surveying time. It's very highly accurate. You can create detailed building analysis that is buildable over time and you can import also into different formats like uh, AutoCAD or ArcGIS and other like multiple different formats you can import your BIM into. Uh, you can, it reduces cost by adding on to an original BIM so you don't need to redo the whole thing to add on to it. Um, and for remodeling and knowing exactly where utilities are within a structure. So there are a lot of benefits. Today's, uh, today's future outlook and what we're doing right now with BIM it, right now, we did the 3D version. So that takes into account existing conditions through laser scans or if you're outside doing ground, ground penetration radar. Safety and logistics models, animation, renderings, walkthrough, and for prefab, it's, all, it's good for all of that. 4D BIMs go into focus on scheduling, project planning, and phasing simulations. So. Um, if you've heard of the lean scheduling for just-in-time deliveries, I think like Amazon and Walmart do that to refill their shelves. That's what the 4D BIM is included. And detailed simulations of installations of large equipment into, um, into tight spaces so you can, you can actually make sure that it's gonna fit and how you're gonna fit it in there before you actually get that equipment. 5D is for estimation, um, conceptual modeling, and cost planning. So uh, you can visualize scenarios in engineering. 6D goes into sustainability, uh, such as conceptual energy analysis and maintenance tracking. 7D is for facility management. They already have uh, proposed 8D and 9D, but we're not that far yet. So uh, to go back to 7D, facility management applications, that is more for life cycles of buildings, maintenance plans and technical support, and uh, building information as builds. Um, this is our project location right here. This is the Ferris State Welding Lab. We uh, chose this mechanical lab because it had a high level of technical difficulty. And this picture was taken with the um, with the fish eye lens camera. So it's like three pictures, three or more pictures, maybe even four put together there to create that one unusual view. And I will pass it on to Abdul. Hi everyone, my name is Abdul Rahman Gadi, and now I'm going to jump into equipment. We use Trimble TX laser scanner and fish eye lens camera. Um, first, the Trimble TX8 has the capability to scan million points per second and using pulse of light transmitted and reflected from the object to the scanner. And it, it scans at a range of 120 meters to 340 meters extended. Uh, the TX8 takes about three minutes to do a, a standard scan. It weighs about 11 kilograms, and it, it has a long life battery life. Uh, the TX8 also has the ability to use the targetless control, which we use in our was useful in our project. Next, we have the Fish Islands camera, which we use is was Nikon D5300 with a 24.2 megapixel image sensor and it has a wide angle LCD screen. In our project we also included uh, the circular fish islands with a 3.5 millimeter focal length so we can use it to do the fish eye um, images. And we also use the adjustable tilting ring mount to take six pictures for each setup <coughs> in our project. Now I'm going to talk about the, the best setup and the first station we, we set, up, set it up in our project. 
So we select this station as the first station, and we make the station as our, our reference to the other stations. And we had about four stations with 360 degrees for each, each scan. And after each setup, we took six photos in the same place we recorded our data uh, to give the data the real colors and richnesses for each object in the point log data. We also choose the high precision moon point cloud density, which has about a uh, point spacing of 30, 30 meter per 5.7 millimeter. Um, we took about approximately 10 minutes per scan, and we had about a total of 1.5 billion points in our point cloud data. Um, total scan and setup time took us about three hours. Um, that us doing it for the first time with the new equipment. And now I'm going, I'm going to turn it over to Muhammad. Who's, oh, sorry, I forgot something. Next, we're going to move into processing. And we use Trimble RealWork software to process our data. Um, we started with registration of the data in the RealWork software, and then classification. And then we moved into modeling, which has creation and edit. And then we created a fly-through high-definition video. Uh, now I'm going to move, turn it over to Muhammad, who's going to talk about the registration. My name is Muhammad Alikwi. So after importing our data, the, the scans, and the pictures that we took to Trimble Rework software, uh, after uploading, then we need to to, visual, to visualize the data by creating a sample scan feature which is under registration. So, uh, as you see the, in the top here, it is showing uh, the, the sampling scan creation. Uh, we choose uh, we choose uh, the we choose the resolution is 0 0.01 millimeter, which means a point will be visualized at every hundred of a millimeter. So after uh, after applying this step, all the scans all the scans uh, will be overlapping one another at the centroid of the project. Uh, as you see here, it is uh, we have the same wall three times in the same picture, and this is a, a picture from the outside for the point cloud, which is showing the overlapping for the all the stations that we have. So this is where the next step of registration begins. Uh, the next step is automatic target based registration. So we choose auto extract target under registration also, and we choose uh, our first station, which is the first scan, as a as a reference station because uh, which will not move during the process, and it is a central because also it is a central scan. So after applying this, uh, the, after applying, uh, everything is going to, all the points are going to be organized based on the stations. And as you know, as I told you, the first station is going to be a reference station. And this process takes around 10 minutes because uh, we have the high, uh, a high number for the point cloud, which is 1.5 billion. So after registration, we will find uh, we will get the registration report, which is showing us uh, cloud to cloud error. So we have got uh, overall cloud to cloud error 1.3 millimeter, and uh, we can see the error between each 
two stations individually. And we have got the largest uh, error was 1.7. So we have got the overall is 1.30. After registration, uh, after registration, we move to production mode. Uh, and we start to classify our uh, point cloud into parts. So we segment our uh, our point cloud into six parts. There is there is auto classification and manual. We have did the manual because it is more it is more accurate. So we have uh, a wall point cloud, walls point cloud, and uh, pipes. Here is the floor the tables and the chairs, uh, the machine, and the gas cylinders. So after uh, classifying, we start model the point cloud that we had uh, by creation and editing. Uh, but uh, we create them by using cloud-based modeler and geometry creator, and we edit them using modify geometry and intersect tools. So I'm going to pass it right now to Amar to talk about cloud-based model. Hey everyone, my name is Ahmad Abdrou. I will be talking about the software processing here. So as Mohammed mentioned before, the cloud-based model is one part of the creation. And uh, this is an example of the small section that we modeled. Uh, the cloud-based modeler is a tool that allows the, the user to let the program create a model based on the point cloud that has been selected by a specific geometry, uh, geometry type, uh, one of the like 10 geometry types that the software has. And I would like to show you how we have done this small section. So we had to break the point clouds to four parts and give each one a specific geometry type and run the modeling. So this is how we got the final product of the model. So for the second one, this is the robotic was in the corner of the lab. So since the robotic has a huge details that we weren't allowed to run a, a specific geometry. So what we did, we used the manual tool that we just draw the boundary lines around the point cloud we have to model and let the software model it and uh, under the selected area we did and this is the final product for these point clouds. Same thing here for the walls. All the walls have the plane geometry, but unfortunately we couldn't like run the holes one time because the software will not allow, will not accept anything if it's not straight on one section. So we had to break the walls to seven parts and model each one separately and then connect them to each other. So for the geometry creator, the second tool of the creation. So we use we use this tool when we have uh, not enough point clouds. I mean, some spots, we didn't get enough point clouds. So as you see the chairs here, we are missing the top part here. So what we did, we create the geometry here by using the box geometry. And we tried as much as we could to match this geometry to the point cloud we had so it can give us the real look of the section we are modeling. So now I will go to the second part of the modeling, which is the edit process. So once the model has been created, some of the products uh, has to be adjusted in some cases, even if we use the base cloud modeler or the geometry creator, because noise and missing points will most likely end up with like wrong dimension. So in this case, we use the modified geometry that will allow us to adjust the location, the dimension for the model we already created. Like this pipe, we had lots of noise around this pipe, so when we run the model, we got a wrong dimension. It's actually used to be like smaller than the actual lock, so 
we own the uh, modified geometry and mix it looks similar to the uh, void cloud we had and match it as much as we could. And the second tool is the intersect. So this is one of the most useful tool we had for this project since we have like a huge number of pipes. And this tool will allow you to connect uh, one, uh, two or more pipes in the same time from different location and in different dimension. So you see here, this, this cylinder has different dimension and diameter has this cylinder. So you just run this uh, tool and we'll connect it automatically without like uh, worry too much about the dimensions and about the noise or anything else. So this is this is a view of the final product we have after modeled and adjusted. And uh, <coughs> after the model has been ready, we applied two features for this model. The first one is The first one is the measurements. So here we gonna go to the, Misha used to talk in the beginning about the benefits. So now here's the benefits of this model. So now we are able to do a real measurements. So we have applied two measurements, vertical measurements and horizontal measurements. And you can do any type of measurements, uh, area, volume, volume, anything. But we have to do the horizontal and vertical measurements. So for the horizontal measurements we got from the wall, the width is 9.46 meter. And I'm sure you're gonna ask me how accurate is that? It's actually pretty accurate because we went to the site this morning and we measured this distance using the 10 measurements. Uh, we got 9.45, which is it 0.1 centimeter difference. That will leave us 0.1 percent error, which is it pretty accurate. And here I'm, I would like to show you that all you need to do when you do the measurements, you just pick up the start point, the end point, and then the program will automatically adjust the closest area, the closest distance between these two points and give you the most accurate st uh, straight line for between these two points. Um, this is the second feature, which is it, the fly-through video we did for the final product. So for the fly-through video, you actually always able to adjust the back way where the video are being. So you can go in any section, any spot you want and see the, the small details we have done. And we classified the water lines with green blue color, the vent uh, system with the gray color, the pressure, uh, the pressure air system with the ring, and finally the power with the red color. And we try to put as much uh, specific details like the small valves, and pipes, the water pipes, and the small valves also in the cylinders with the handles we did uh, manually. As, as you see here, the difficult small pipes, they are just intersect between each other and just makes it really hard to go between these two points plots and use it. And this is the second fly through also video. Uh, it's 30 seconds. They're gonna show you the difference between the point clouds and the final we have. As you see here, we had lots of noise in the point cloud. Uh, compared to the final product, it's really clean and you can see the details or, or anything you have modeled and you want to put it in the final products. So for now, I, this is pretty much for the software processing and I will really leave the rest for Abdurrahman uh, Qadi talking about the cost and the time estimating. The industry standard fee for the laser scan for a whole day is about a thousand dollar, but we estimated that for a half day, which is going to be 
hundred dollar. The crew fee is a, a two hundred dollar per hour. So we had a three hours, probably six hundred dollar. The processing registration is really modeling. It's about we spend about sixty hours, and it's one hundred twenty five dollar per hour. So total was seven seventy five hundred. And the total project estimation is <coughs> $8,600. And the total an hour invested 63 hours, uh, including the three hours of um, field work and the 60 hours of the processing. Here are the reference we used. And we would like to thank Professor Deshpanda, Professor Parasai, and our industrial advisors, Mark Tinhoff from Michigan Survey Supply us with the uh, laser scanner Fribble TX8 and Jason Heiss, a 3D laser scanning specialist at Fribble Navigation, who help us with the processing. And thank you all for your time. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you.